All right. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. It's the uh, first Sunday of the month of June, and we'll be working through a, a smaller passage as we've been uh, slowly working through the book of Revelation. Uh, so we'll be doing the first 12 verses of Revelation 9. Let me go ahead and, and share my screen. Uh, <clears throat> okay. I've thought about what's the best way to go about um, this particular passage. And, and I think the best thing to do for all of us, because, um, because based, depending on whatever tradition you have come out of, um, you, you might have never heard a Bible study on this chapter at all. Um, so it might just be completely brand new to you. And if something's brand new, you've hadn't had any time to think about it or to um, maybe you just don't really have a lot of exposure to it. Uh, on top of the fact that some of the symbolism in Revelation is uh, foreign to us uh, because we don't live in the first century world. Uh, they live in the first century world. And also because um, we might not have as strong of an Old Testament background in our in our upbringing. So, um, so let me let me do this. I guess probably the first thing I want to do is just make sure that we situate chapter nine um, into its its wider context. <clears throat> okay. So um, a little bit of review here, but I I don't have the time to go through and to just read everything. We just, we just can't do that. Um, so this, this is just kind of making sure we fit. Where, where does Revelation chapter 9 fit into everything? All right. Um, earlier in chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, 6, 9 through 11, uh, there was the breaking of the fifth seal, okay? The, the lamb has a, has a scroll, and he's breaking up all these seals. The scroll contains the will of God. And uh, so in order to prepare us for what the will of God is in the book of Revelation, he's breaking off these seals. And... We learn in the fifth seal that there are Christians, Christians who've been martyred, and and their their voice is is calling forth for retribution and vengeance and for God to repay those who have you know harassed and persecuted other Christians, and it says that their um, their their prayer is kind of heard by God, but God kind of answers in that section. Again, that's chapter six, verses nine through eleven. Um, he says, "Okay, you guys, you guys need to wait because we need a, a full number of of people that are going to be killed as you are. Meaning, we need more people to die as Christian martyrs. Uh, specifically, and it's really important for us to understand this, is that they were martyred because of the gospel message and the testimony that they maintained. Okay, uh, they weren't killed in a church bombing." Uh, they weren't just executed just for the sake of being a Christian. They, it, they were specifically persecuted, harassed, and ultimately killed because they were faithful witnesses of Jesus' gospel. Okay? It's, it's, they were faithful preachers of a message. Um, you know, they stood up for what was right, and they spoke out against the fallen world. Okay? Uh, that's a key theme in Revelation is that Revelation is encouraging people to be faithful witnesses, to take the message that uh, the lamb spoke and to make that their own message and to use it as something to preach to another kingdom and to preach to the, the exaltation and kingship of another Lord, not the kingdom of Rome and not the, um, the emperor of Rome, but you know, the kingdom of God and of course, King Jesus. <clears throat> so, um, and then at the beginning of chapter eight, we have the introduction of uh, seven trumpets. Okay. I don't know about you, but if I if I ever hear a trumpet, you know, I'm looking around thinking, okay, what's what's going to come next? A trumpet announces something, you know, and in the in the biblical world, the trumpet would announce, um, you know, the king is arriving, or there's an important announcement, or you know, trumpets prepare us for what's about to come next. Okay, so seven trumpets, um, and at the beginning of it, it asks the question, okay, what if what if uh, you know. The, the prayers of these these martyrs what if what if those prayers go up before God and they function as incense and if God responds to those prayers with uh, with violence 
and with destruction. Okay, remember these Christians? They're uh, you know they've a uh, lot, lot of people in, in the churches have been martyred, and there are a lot of Christians that are praying for God to vindicate them, to judge the, the evil, uh, the evil people. So what if? So chapter eight kind of begins this hypothetical question: What if God decides to respond um, to evil with um, with judgment? Okay, with nothing other than judgment. Okay, and. So chapter eight and chapter nine is is an example as to what that would look like. Okay, now we can kind of jump ahead. It's really really important to understand how that sequence of the narrative begins and how the sequence of the narrative is going to end. Okay, so we can skip down here, and this is really really important to understand the function of this narrative because after two entire chapters, chapters eight and nine of Revelation, of God giving these these trumpets, really it's really the first six. Um, of showing if God uh, was to respond um, with uh, violence and vengeance uh, and retribution. Retribution is probably the best word. Uh, retributive justice. Um, what would that bring about? And so you can see here, we can see already the answer. Chapter 9 and verse 20 it says, The rest of mankind who are not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as to not worship demons, idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, wood, which by the way, they can't see, nor hear, nor walk. Next verse. And they did not repent of their murders, their sorceries, their immorality, or their thefts. Okay, so the point is that um, if God was to respond um, to the prayers of the saints that are looking for vengeance, they're looking for revenge, uh, they, they want God to just deal with the bad people and to punish them, okay? If God was to threaten people with punishment, um, and, and with all the detail and the metaphor and the poetry that we see in all of chapter 8 and all of chapter 9, look at the response. The response is people don't change. They don't repent. It says it twice. Verse 20, they don't repent. Verse 21, they don't repent, okay? And so what this does is it moves the narrative forward into chapter 10 and chapter 11 to receive what God actually needs to accompany um, this, this threatening message is the faithful witness of his people, okay? And so in, in chapter 10, we'll learn that that scroll that the lamb has been taking forever to break, he says, okay, John, I want you to eat it. And John eats it, and it becomes a message that he is supposed to speak. And then when we get to chapter 11, we have the vision of two witnesses that are speaking forth the message, are speaking forth the testimony. Uh, and that is what brings about um, the change in the repentance that God wants, okay? And then actually after the witnessing of the two witnesses, which is, we'll get to that point, it's, it's, an, it's a symbolism for the witness of the church and the church's responsibility to evangelize the world and to maintain the, the gospel message of Jesus uh, and to call people to repentance, not just with the threat of judgment, the threat of judgment is real, but by doing it with the, accompanied with the faithful witness that Jesus preached. Um, it's only after that that we get to the seventh trumpet. Okay, so there's a big, there's a kind of a long pause between these first six trumpets and then the, the kind of reorientation of, hey, Threatening people with judgment by itself is not enough, okay? That doesn't get people to change. What gets people to change? We need to incorporate the witness of Jesus. So that's kind of the big picture of where we're at now. That's, that's where we're standing here. So when we're looking at this passage in chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. Um, this is in the midst of these, these visions of what it would be like if God is trying to threaten people with judgment with the hopes of bringing them to repentance. But as we ultimately see at the end of this chapter, we just read in verses 20 through 21, that people aren't going to change. They aren't going to repent, okay? So that's what this is, okay? So because of that, I'll just make this point straight, okay? These are not visions of actual things that are going to happen in the future, okay? I know a lot of people think that they are, but that's not how this functions in the narrative of Revelation, okay? <clears throat> and we can see a, a couple of things uh, for people that have been taught that, oh, you need to read, read Revelation as if it's this ongoing timeline of events, okay? Uh, I'll just, I'll make one particular point. Um, so we're here in chapter 9. If you look in chapter 8 in verse 7, okay? And I spent 
chapter eight's kind of complex. We actually spent two entire sessions on chapter eight. So, so what happened just, and this is, this is still in the vision of the trumpets. Okay. So chapter eight and chapter nine is all, all trumpets. This is all, it's not like we're jumping around previously. Look what happens here at the very end of this. It says all the green grass was burnt up. All the green grass was burnt up. Okay. When we get to chapter nine, we're going to, we're going to see the main thing you're going to get at chapter nine is that, wow, there's a bunch of locusts. Okay. Look in chapter nine. What, what was, what is told to the locusts? They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green tree, nor any tree, any green thing or any tree, but only the men who don't have the seal of God in their foreheads. Folks, how in the world are they able to hurt the grass? If all the grass was burnt up chronologically before this, it doesn't work. Do you see that? A chronological reading doesn't make any sense. That's because that's not how this is supposed to be worked, okay? This is a symbolic narrative that's trying to evoke the people of God to, um, uh, to, to change their behavior, to stop compromising. This is written to seven churches, and those churches um, have a variety of people, just like the church today, uh, people that are not fully sold out on God and Christ, they're compromising. And so this is trying to get them to compromise, or try, try, not, not trying to get them to compromise, trying to get them to repent from their compromise, um, to no longer give allegiance to the world and to its, um, its kings and its lifestyle, and to be fully allegiant to God and uh, the Lamb. So anyway, so that's, that's just a couple of background things. Okay, so probably the best thing to do now that we've kind of situated this as best as I can. I mean, I, I can't go back and do all the details because we've already spent, you know, 20 hours doing the first eight chapters. So um, you'll have to go and check the YouTube to fill in all those details. Um, let me have a volunteer, please, uh, to read this section. So it's just the first 12 verses. You can read it off my screen. You can read it off your translation. I don't think it'll matter too much. Would someone be blessed to do oh. that? I'll read it. Okay. Chapter 9, verse 1. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth. The key of the bottomless pit was given to him. He opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went out, went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given, was given them as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die and death flees from them. The appearance of the locusts was like the horses prepared for battle. And on their heads appeared to be crowns like gold. And their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like the hair of a woman, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. Do you want me to read to 12? Please. Okay. They had the breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings were like the sound of chariots of many horses rushing to battle. They have tails like scorpions and stings, and in their tails their power is their power to hurt men for five months. They have a king over them, the angel of the abyss. His name in the Hebrew is Abaddon, and in the Greek, he has the name Apollyon. The first woe is past, behold, two woes are still coming after these things. Wow. Yeah, I just kind of thought, okay, that's, that's a, that's a decent chunk that we can we could try to work with. Okay, <clears throat> so I will say this: uh, if you are familiar with your Old Testament, uh, there should be a variety of, and I mean, like, really, really familiar. Um, this should really evoke a lot of passages to where you can you can say, okay, 
I recognize this particular metaphor that's used in the Old Testament. Um, but a lot of us are not um, uh, accustomed to the Old Testament, uh, kind of like they were in their culture. Uh, so we got to do a little, we got to do a little, work, a little work. So I actually, I, I have some notes here on the side. Um, if anyone wants to take notes, I won't be able to check all of these things, but um, there's, there's some really key points that I think um, uh, represent the pool of images that John is drawing from in order to convey this, this vision. Okay, so we, we've read that and basically, okay, so how, how would we summarize what we just read? Okay, we have a vision and it's, this, this, well, it's, it's, the, it's the fifth trumpet, okay? And it starts off with the unlocking of the bottomless pit, which by the way is, is just a, a, a literal rendering of the word abyss. And the word abyss means literally an unending pit. It's, it's, a, it's a pit that has no bottom, okay? You can go and think about that in your mind right now, a pit that has no bottom. And you, you can already think, okay, this can't be literal. That's just impossible, okay? So there's, there's just no place on earth that just has no bottom. It just it doesn't work that way, okay? So, um, and also, by the way, if you remember back in chapter four, we have actually chapter four and chapter five, we have these extensive visions of heaven and how everything in heaven is just completely oriented around the one who is seated upon the throne. This is a vision of like the opposite side of the coin, okay? If heaven is way up there, then what is the furthest possible place from heaven? Well, the bottomless pit. And look at how terrible it, it looks. It's got smoke that's coming up from it. It's like a furnace. And it's got these locusts that are scorpions that are grasshoppers. And they have teeth like lions. And they look like armies. And they're out there to torment people. And that, I mean, this is like, I don't want to have anything to do with this vision. I don't want to be a part of this. I don't want to, I don't want to be associated with this. Okay, so, but, uh, so I'm just going to kind of go down my, my list here. There are some key references in the Old Testament that I think are really important uh, for us for us to look at. And so, well, a lot of what we're doing here is kind of, I want us to keep the main thrust of what Revelation 9, 1 through 12 is doing uh, in our minds as best we can, and then to go back to these references and to start to think, okay, now that I see these references, like Exodus 10 and Joel 2 are probably the most important references to understanding this. If you don't get anything out of this, write down uh, Exodus 10 and Joel chapter 2. That is, those are the biggest keys for you to understand what's going on here. Those are, he's drawing on those passages more than the others. <clears throat> um, and so let's, let's look at that. Let's just kind of look and see what this is. Now remember, the function of chapter 9 is what if God was to pour out his wrath on the ungodly um, in order to get them to change. Wrath alone, does wrath alone bring about change? Uh, we saw at the end of chapter nine, no, it doesn't bring them to repentance, okay? So it's very interesting to look at the passages um, that stand at the foundation, Exodus 10 and Joel 2, and to see how else are these passages used to demonstrate God threatening judgment, not with the hopes of just wiping people out, because God is a vengeful person, no, it seems that these passages are going to uh, try to solicit a change of, of heart, a, a repentance, a change in behavior. So let's look at that. Okay. <clears throat> we'll start here in, uh, in Exodus uh, 10, um, 1 through 17. Um, let me, I can put that there. Okay. So I'm going to read this pretty quickly, just kind of skim through it. Obviously, this is... Um, Moses and Aaron in front of Pharaoh um, in the Exodus account. Okay, so this is what we'll do. I'll put my notes up here so we can kind of still see. All right, so then Yahweh said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may perform these signs among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, that you may know that I am Yahweh. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Notice that, by the way. Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, I will bring locust into your territory. Okay, what are they going to do? They will cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the land. 
So notice that they're, they're already covering things, all right? They will eat the rest of what has escaped, uh, what is left of you from the hail. They will eat every tree that sprouts for you out of the field. And your houses will be filled in the house of your servants and the houses of all the Egyptians, something which neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from that day that they come upon the earth until this day. And he turned and went out to Pharaoh. Or seven, Pharaoh's servant said to him, how long will this man be a snare to us? Let the man go, let, sorry, let the men go that they may serve Yahweh their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is destroyed? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh and he said to them, go serve Yahweh your God. Who are the ones that are going? Moses said, we shall be going with our young and our old, our sons and our daughters, the flocks, the herds shall go. We're going to hold a feast to Yahweh. Then he said to them thus, uh, may Yahweh be with you. If ever I let you and your little ones go, take heed for evil is in, is in your mind. Not so. Go now, the men among you, and serve Yahweh, and that is what you desire. So they were driven off from, the, from Pharaoh's presence. Uh, verse 12, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locust, and they're going to come upon the land of Egypt and eat every plant of the land, even all the hill is left. So Moses stretched out a staff over the land of Egypt, and Yahweh directed an east wind and all the land, all the day and all the night, when it was morning, the east wind brought locusts. Locusts came up over the land of Egypt, settled in the territory of Egypt. They were numerous. Never had been so many locusts, nor will there ever be so many again. Okay, notice, by the way, that, that refrain. It's, it's hyperbole. Um, <clears throat> for they covered the surface of the whole land. The land was darkened. Notice, by the way, everything's darkened. They ate every plant of the land and all the fruits and the trees and the hills that left. Uh, nothing that was green was left on the tree or the plant field throughout the land of Egypt. Notice here, notice the response. This is critical. Then Pharaoh hurried, called for Moses and Aaron, and he said, I have sinned against Yahweh your God and against you. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin only this once and make supplication to Yahweh your God that he may remove this death from me. Okay, notice not the plague, not the locust, remove death from me. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so clearly Revelation 9 is drawing on this passage, but it's altering the passage in some pretty considerable ways. You can see here in verse 4 that they're doing the exact opposite of what locusts do. Locusts, as we saw in the Exodus uh, account, they eat every single thing that's green. Here, these locusts do the opposite. They don't eat a single thing that's green. But what they do is they focus on the torment of certain people. Now, are these people the faithful people of God? No. No, they're not. Okay. These people are protected, just like in the book of Exodus, the faithful people of God were protected. Okay. It's those who don't have the seal of God on their forehead. Okay. We've already talked about this in Revelation. Um, you're either identified with God and the Lamb, or you're identified with the beast. You have to pick one, okay? Um, and a seal of God is not, an act, it's not a literal seal. Um, it's, it's, it's a stamp of ownership, okay? You either belong to God and the lamb or you belong to the beast. And so you have to pick one. So, of course, people reading this would say, oh, wow, I'd, I'd rather be identified with God. And, of course, if a Christian is compromising in those churches, you know, they're going to see that, oh, well, I'm not truly identified with this because I'm trying to play it both ways. I'm trying to be a Christian on Sunday and be a worldly person on you know, Monday through Saturday. So, okay. So, so there's some pretty critical differences there. Also, by the way, we have, where is this? In verse six, these, in these days, they will seek death. They will not find it. They will long to die and death flees from them. Well, what do we see from Pharaoh? Take this death away from me. You know, like this way. Oh, I just, I, I want it to go away. All right. These people like the, they, they're, they would, they're going to choose to die. They would rather die but notice it's, it's death, this personified death is like running away from them. That's the sense of the, of the torture that these locusts are going to bring. Okay. Um, but notice there, the key thing is that in the Exodus one, in the Exodus account, look at what the locusts actually did. They, they brought Pharaoh to repentance for a little while, by the way. By the way, at the end of the account, after God took away the locusts, Pharaoh hardened his heart uh, and, and didn't last in that repentance. But the interesting thing is that, you know, okay, the function of the locust was to get him to repent, was to get him to change, was to get um, the evil people of this world to let the people of God go, okay? 
Um, and of course, we're seeing here the function of locust is to bring about repentance, but at the end, they don't really bring about repentance. We saw that in Revelation 9, 20 through 21. Okay, so Exodus chapter 10, one of our key references. The other one is in Joel 2. Okay, now I'm, I'm hesitant to even bring this up because uh, there's, there's a lot of complexity in Joel 2. I don't have time to go through and to talk about all of it because it's been used by a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. So I'm going to try to just look at Joel 2 because I do think Joel 2 is, um, in, in some sense, a... Uh, a stronger reference for Revelation 9. But let's, let's look at it and again ask the question, okay, what is, what, is, what is the moral function of this chapter? What sort of behavior is it trying to bring about for its readers? Okay, uh, it's kind of long. It's 25 verses. So I'm going to try to skim through it. Now let's, let's keep with English. Let's do that and we'll keep my notes here. Okay. All right, so, so do, just... I know we're kind of going through a lot of stuff, um, but just do your best. And as you read through this here, start to think, okay, what, what sort of things in Joel uh, ha, uh, have been pulled out to use for the, the Revelation 9 passage? Okay. All right. Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound alarm on the holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. A day of gloom and darkness, a day of clouds and thick darkness. We saw that in, Re in Revelation. Dawn spread over the mountain. There will be a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there ever be anything like it in the years of many generations. By the way, we saw that back in Exodus. Okay. Verse 3, a fire consumes before them, behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them. That's interesting. But a desolate wilderness behind them. Nothing at all escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses. Notice there, the it is like the appearance of horses. They're not real horses. It's like the appearance of horses. And they are like war horses when they run. We saw that in Revelation 9. Uh, with the noise as of chariots. That's also in Revelation 9. They leap on the tops of the mountains. Boy, that's hyperbole. Uh, like the crackling of the flame of the fire that consumes the stubble, like the mighty people arranged for battle. Okay. Before the people are all in anguish, all faces turn pale. That's hyperbole. Um, they run like mighty men. Notice they, they're like mighty men. They climb the wall like the soldiers. They each march in line. They don't deviate from their path. They do not crowd each other. They march uh, everyone in their path. When they burst the defenses, they do not break ranks. They rush on the city, they run on the wall, they climb on the houses, they enter through the windows like a thief. Before them, the earth quakes. The heavens tremble, the sun and the moon glow, uh, grow dark, and the stars lose their brightness. We also saw that in Revelation 9. Notice how God responds. Yahweh utters his voice before the army. Surely his camp is very great, for strong is he who carries out his word. The day of Yahweh is indeed great and very awesome who can endure it. Yet even now, declares Yahweh, notice here the response, return to me with all your heart and with fasting, and weeping, and mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments. Return to Yahweh your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. Okay, notice there's a, it's, 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 it's almost, uh, it's conditional here. It's, if you return to God, God is willing to relent of this evil, okay? Who knows whether he will not turn and relent? and leave a blessing behind him, even a grain offering and a drink offering for Yahweh your God, okay? So God, the point of all this, as we see, is to get people to change, to get people to repent, to turn back, to turn to God with all their heart. By the way, that's drawing on the Shema of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, okay? Now, there's a lot of other details in here, but the key thing to get, by the way, is verse 25, okay? The important I'll say this, the most important verse in Joel 2 is verse 25. Look at, look at what the, the prophet does to explain what was just said. God, this is God speaking, okay? Then I, this is Yahweh, I will make up for you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten. The creeping locust, the stripping locust, and the gnawing locust, which, by the way, is my great army, which I sent among you. Okay? Do you see what just happened there? 
he just described in the first however many verses a metaphor of this great army and he's like well it's like men it's like soldiers it's like horses it's like chariots but down in verse 25 he tells you what it is what is the great army that i sent among you it's locust it's locust that's what they are it's not a real army this tells you this, and you can, you can read the commentaries, you can read, they say, look, verse 25 explains what it is. This is not something that I'm making up to you, okay? He says right there, again, very clearly, the creeping locust, the, the stripping locust and the non-locust, they are <clears throat> my great army, which I sent among you, okay? So, but what was the function of the sending of the locust, which, by the way, were described like darkness that covers the land, like a great army, like this terrible thing. The function of it, again, was to get people to repent. It was to get people to change, okay? So now we have two passages. We've got Exodus 10 and Joel 2, which shows locust, and the function of the locust <clears throat> is not to eat up all your vegetation. The function of the locust is, is to, to threaten people with judgment so that they'll change, so that they'll repent, okay? And that's what we see there in Revelation chapter 9. That's pretty important. <clears throat> Let me actually let me do this before I go and fill in some of the other details. I think that's probably the most critical point. Let me let me stop for a second and, and see. Are there any is there anything that I can clarify on that? Like any clarification questions? Um, just real quick before I move on and try to um, unpack some of the other details. Uh so in the Old Testament, it was talking about real locusts, like with the, the um, plagues, but in, the, in Revelation, it's not. Is that correct? Well, it, 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 is, it is locust, but the way that the narrative is functioning is what would it look like if, if God was to pour out his wrath on people in response to the prayers of the saints that are asking for vengeance? Okay, so it's not, what it's not doing is it's not, giving a prophecy about something that is a, 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 an absolute thing that is going to happen. I, I, well, it, it is a prophecy. It is not a predictive prophecy of actual events that are going to happen in the future. Okay. It's, it's a prophecy as in, I mean, it's, it's, that's, that's why it's important to kind of see that. Um, a lot of people think prophecy and they think, oh, it must be predicting something in the future. Uh, that's not even the primary meaning of prophecy. Like, the famous prophets of the Old Testament were Elijah and Elisha. Never once did they predict the future. They always spoke to the I, people. I know that there's other prophecy, but but in that context in Revelation, that was my question. Was it yeah. not predictive? Uh, yeah, that, that, that doesn't seem, within the narrative that we looked at, that doesn't seem to be what uh, what the readers would have walked away with. And again, if it was, we're already running into contradictions. Like, how do you read some of these things? Like, how in the world are the locusts told to eat up all the green grass when there's no green grass at all? It was all taken away in the previous chapter. It doesn't work. It doesn't fit. You can't read this on a chronological timeline. So, um, and actually, we'll, we'll learn later, like back in, like, later in chapter 16, the green grass is going to show back up again. Well, I thought the, the locusts ate all the green grass. What do you do with that? You know, it just, it doesn't work on a chronological timeline uh, for those who read it that way. But yeah, it's a good question. Good, good thing to clarify. Uh, Sergio? Yeah, just to make sure. So with the, with the green grass thing, what you're saying is that, that um, let me see if I can say this right, not that it's figurative, but that it's just not in chronological order? Well, it's, it's, it's both. I mean, there's, it's obvious that, in, in, especially in the Joel passage and in Revelation, um, we, we are reading, I don't want to say figurative, figurative, some people hear that and they think, um, oh, it has no meaning. No, it, it's symbolism, which means it does have meaning, but we just need to figure out what is the function of the, of the symbolism. Uh, and the locusts in Exodus are real, okay? And I think, I think the threats are real, but the purpose of the threats are not to predict the future. The purpose of them is to, is to bring about change, to bring about repentance, Mm. Okay, to where, um, and the, the irony is that Pharaoh, which everyone kind of understands in Exodus is kind of like the bad guy, he repented in Exodus, but in Revelation, these people aren't going to repent. Mm. So, uh, Dean has his hand raised. You know, I'm a little confused on some of this. I, I understand that the 
in Exodus, the locusts were literal. And the whole purpose of all the plagues uh, were to get Pharaoh to repent until the final plague, which was absolute judgment. Um, but in Revelation, um, I, I don't really understand is, you know, that's a threat that, that, that God is saying. Is that what you're saying in Revelation 9? Well, well it's, again, in, in, the, in, in the narrative of Revelation, uh, the, the opening of the trumpets is a direct response to the prayers of the saints that are Christian martyrs uh, that are praying um, for God to vindicate them for vengeance. They want retributive justice, okay? And so God responds to those prayers. This is in Revelation 8, like verses 1 through 5. God responds to those prayers by taking that, those prayers in the incense and taking fire from the, the altar of, of, a, of a temple and throwing it down to earth, okay? So these are, these are responses to it, okay? But we learn in the narrative of Revelation that that doesn't bring about the change that God wants. And of course, once we get to chapter 10, uh, the tone changes. It's like, okay, we need something else that's going to work. What is going to bring about repentance? And, and it, it introduces the theme of, um, of the body of Christ preaching the gospel um, as, as a witness. So, Okay, so what I'm under, trying to understand is that these are the prayers of the saints who are you know, faithful and they're you know, standing for God and his son and so on and so forth. And this is his response that he actually does, but it doesn't bring repentance. Is he actually doing this? Is God going to actually do this, you know, uh, where the locusts actually devour the evil men? Or is that just a threat? Is he actually doing this? That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's that's not how this would have been understood. Because why, why would God do something knowing that it's not going to bring about um, so that, so it's, it's just a, it's not a literal, it's a threat, but it's not carried out. I can see, I don't understand that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, <clears throat> um, it, it, it's a, it's part of the narrative that's building up and it's showing that, um, you know, God, God doesn't want to just destroy people. Okay. I understand that. I understand. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's, it, it's about changing behavior. Okay. And, and the book is about changing behavior. Okay. And so it's going to give these visions in a very interesting and up and down and complex narrative, uh, in order to change that behavior. Okay. And so one of the things we looked at in chapter eight is that, uh, all of those, um, all of those threats would have been understood even by non-biblical people, uh, as warnings from the gods, meaning the gods are unhappy and that they should turn and try to seek the favor of the gods, okay? Uh, so what we're seeing here in chapter 9 is much of the same, okay? Um, you know, things are not good, but but the point of it is to bring about the change, okay? Okay, so what you're saying, and I guess I'm trying to under, I guess I'm understanding this, is that this is a, this is a warning and that's where it ends. It is not actually carried out. Uh, I, I think the warning is carried out. Well, not in, in that verse, though, right? What, you know, if he's going to devour these people, then they're, they're gone. Well, there's no, the warning to these people, okay? It, it, it is. It, it, it is a warning. I get that, okay? But also, it, none of these people are, are killed in this, in this passage. All right, so it's, in other words, it's not carried out. In that passage, I, I think you, you might. I'm wondering if, and I don't know this. Uh, I'm wondering if, if, you're, if you're coming to this passage, wondering how is this literally going to be fulfilled. Uh, that's the wrong question to bring to the text of Revelation, I think, um, because this, this is it's all about um, the symbolism and uh, the images that it evokes, and the and the behavior that that symbolism and those images are trying to bring about. And, and, and to change in the lives of God's people, especially in churches to where we've already read in chapters two and three, 
that the people of God are compromising and God wants them to, or Christ wants them to repent. So, well, what I'm understanding is I, I understand that eventually all evil people who have rejected God and Christ will come to nothing. Uh, they yeah, will that, that, that's absolutely true. No doubt. But, okay. I, I okay. don't think that the, the purpose of, of Revelation 9 is to prophetically predict the coming of literal locusts, which will, by the way, not eat green stuff, which, by the way, will literally come out of some abyss. Um, I, I just think it doesn't work. It just it's that is that is a, that is missing the point um, of, of the symbolism and the imagery. So what? I, I, I understand the fact that it's not the uh, literal locus, but okay. What yeah, you're, I'm you're, just trying to make sense of it. What you're saying then is it represents, it symbolizes judgment, and God has done things like that in the past, and it's a warning to people about God's judgment and, you know, that they're on thin ice and they're, you're, they're, they're, you know, they may be destroyed, but, you know, they're going to be destroyed if they don't repent. Is that? Well, I, okay. Well, not, not exactly. Let me see if I got this right. Cause this is, uh, yeah. Um, I think this is the thing, the message that you're trying to say, Dustin, let me see if I got it. Is that, yes, there is a warning here. Um, and it's drawing on Old Testament language and actual occurrences in the Old Testament. But what is being demonstrated is that doesn't actually work to bring about repentance. Yes, yes, right there. The threat of judgment alone without the accompanied witness of the people of God doesn't bring about the repentance that God wants. That's the key point. That's it. Well, and that's basically what was shared before and I guess in Revelation 6, right? The same principle that that judgment alone will not do it. It's actually yes, yes. The, the preaching. The thing is, he, he spends two entire chapters, chapters eight and chapter nine, to, to try to make that point. Okay. Okay. So it's like I said, it's 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 hard because I'm trying to like take this little section in the midst of the big picture. Um, and it's a it's a complex story, but um, so it's saying if 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 believers, if Christians are compromising and they're not, their their witness is not happening, that just threat of of of, of punishment or of these consequences is not going to accomplish people repenting. Is that? Is yeah, that well, uh, yes, I, I add to it and say that, remember that the, um, here, let's, I'm going to, I'll go back to, man, I'm feeling like I'm not going to get through all the detail today. That's okay. All right. Um, go back to, to sharing. Well, understanding is more important. Yeah, no, I, I get that. I'm, I'm, I'm with you here. This is good. This is, um, <clears throat> okay. Um, Let's let's uh, let's make sure that we're all super solid on the nature of the prayers um, that 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 are that are here. Okay, in six nine through ten. Okay, this 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 better be highlighted in your Bibles by now because we've already like in Revelation we've now read it like ten times. Okay, all right. Um, so the breaking of the fifth seal involves um, the souls under the altar who have been slain, literally slaughtered, because of the gospel message, the word of God, and the testimony that they had maintained, okay? So they're Christian martyrs, they preached the gospel, and they, they, they died as faithful witnesses, okay? They cry out together with a, with a singular loud voice, and they're asking, how long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on, specifically, those who dwell on the earth, okay? Again, that phrase, those who dwell on the earth, that actually refers to people who are not yet converted okay these are people of fallen babylon these are um these are worldly people these are um people that are that are under the judgment of god okay so these, these are the, the people that have persecuted and harassed the people of god okay um and so they're asking for two things judgment and vengeance judgment and vengeance okay okay god doesn't really answer the prayer he just says hey you just need to wait a little bit longer because we need some more people to be killed the way that you were okay we need more faithful witnesses okay so that that was there beginning in chapter eight okay um we see that 
go right here, three through five. Okay. All right. Uh, we got an angel. Okay. He is adding to this golden censer the prayers of the saints. Okay. What are the prayers of the saints? We just read it in six, nine through 11, the prayers for judgment and vengeance because people in their communities have been martyred as faithful witnesses. Okay. The prayers are understood symbolically as incense that goes up before God. Okay. And then we have what, okay, what would it look like if God mixes that with fire from the altar and throws it down to the earth? Okay. And then the trumpets sound. Okay. The trumpets are what it would look like if God responds to those prayers for judgment and vengeance with wrath alone. In the end, we know it doesn't bring about repentance. It doesn't bring about the change, which shifts the narrative in a very important and considerable way to saying what we need to do now is to take this big scroll that we've been building up for for so many chapters, consume it. It becomes the message that you speak, and now you're supposed to be preaching as faithful witnesses, which, by the way, was the answer um, to the prayer back in chapter 6, verse 11. We need more faithful witnesses. That. Um, I know it's big and I know it's complex, but but every but all the trumpets, at least the first six, have to fit into that narrative. That's what it's doing. Um, Got it. I think I think I get it. Thanks. So basically, it's talking about unbelievers. It's talking about God rejectors. <laughs> but it, it is. Um, but but of course, anybody who's reading this is is certainly thinking, okay, I, I better make. I mean, especially with that reference in nine verse four. <clears throat> to where the people that are protected are only those who have the seal of God on their foreheads, okay? Not the men, by the way. It's the people. It's, it's, it's not, not men as in males, people, uh, the humans. Um, you know, so it, it, of course, it's going to, anyone reading this is going to be persuaded to want to give themselves fully to God, or as we saw in, in Joel, um, return to God with all of their heart, okay? A full <laughs> sense of belief. And that makes sense too. So, okay. Yeah, that makes okay. Uh, I'm going to take Pam's question and then I'm going to um, see if I can fill in some more of the details. Well, I, uh, <laughs> with all that being said, um, the way I understand it, um, especially when you read about um, in Exodus 17, where um, the Pharaoh said, that just this once, so it was like just this once because he had a fear of death, right? One time he's willing to repent for this one thing. You know, it's, it's like almost like the whole Bible shows the effects of the fall on man. I mean, we are li living proof that we have thoughts and intents of our heart that are constantly barraged with evil. And we have to change that. And um, that's what God is trying to me. That's what God is trying to say that no amount of, of uh, wrath is going to necessarily change an individual for the life uh, for the rest of their life. In other words, we have to make that choice every day. I mean, I, I see the symbolism and how it really actually applies to the reality that we live every single day. And um, that's how I'm looking at what's being talked about, what you're teaching um, in Revelation. So when it showed me that when Pharaoh only repented once and of the one thing, please don't, you know, because he had a fear of death, but he went on to continue all of his evil deeds and doing whatever. And then it says in, you know, it says in, um, well, I think at the end of the chapter. Yeah. Um, anyway, it, it just is, you know, there's a lot of things in there that are, that are going to affect change, but it isn't what the wrath is what God is trying to teach us is it is not that the wrath to come is going to necessarily affect change. It has to be, a heart issue with each individual. So anyway. yeah, it, yeah, that's a good, good point. It, it has to be accompanied, at least that's one of the main messages of Revelation, is that um, the way that God wants to bring about the change of the people in this world um, is by the people of God 
taking up the mantle as being faithful witnesses and preaching the message that Jesus preached, which calls people to repentance, and that's going to bring about actual change. Just threatening people with the judgment of God alone is not enough to bring about change, okay? So that's, that's and there's a lot of ways we can take this in our own life. I mean, you know, some people think, well, the way that we deal with our problems is that we marginalize people or that we cut people off or we drop a bomb on them. Um, that doesn't bring about change. It just, it really just, it escalates the spiral of violence. Um, and so what Revelation is saying is actually what, what brings about change is preaching the gospel that Jesus preached, calling people to repentance, um, being faithful witnesses for the true kingdom and the true Lord. Um, and that message I think is really applicable. So yeah. that's kind of, that's a big thing that we want to get out of here. So, um, that's the tough thing is that these are tough chapters because, there's so much more of the narrative that needs to be unpacked. And, um, you know, we have to, we, we have to watch, we go, we gotta, we gotta watch the movie in the order that it comes in. Okay. You can't know the ending of the movie before. So, I mean, a lot of us do, but okay. <coughs> Let me try in the little time we have, cause I want to make sure we got some time to focus on communion and not feel rushed with that. And if, uh, and if I don't get through everything today, that's, that's fine too. That's fine. Okay. So let me, let me see if there's a couple of other little points that we can kind of pick up. So we looked at our, um, we looked at the, the key references to where locusts were used with the point of trying to get people to repent. And we can see that the same thing is happening in Revelation. Let's just kind of pick out a couple of things here. First of all, we have this, um, this, this thing called a bottomless pit, and it's a word for an abyss, okay? Um, and you, we, need, we need to be thinking about how does the abyss function in Revelation, okay? It doesn't show up too often. Um, <clears throat> I think it shows up five times, if I'm not mistaken. But, it, man, it just seems to be like the opposite of heaven. I mean, it's heaven is – everything in heaven is, is focused on everything surrounding the one who is seated upon the throne. The, the abyss – I mean, it's, it, you, should, you really should just put abyss instead of bottomless pit. I mean, that's what abyss means. Okay. I mean, it's just got smoke that's coming up. It's like a furnace and the sun and the air are darkened by this. And I mean, what is it? It's, it's actually locusts that are coming out and, and all the locusts are doing that. Um, <clears throat> let's look, let's, I want to look a little bit here at locust. Um, good passage here. So I've got this here. What, what, what was the fun, another function of locust? Deuteronomy 28, by the way, is, is a section Deuteronomy to where Moses is saying, hey, if you do all of these really bad things, Israelites, you're going to be cursed, and the biggest curse is going to be exile. Um, what is it? Uh, 28:38. Okay. Um, here's one of the threats at the end at the end of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 28:38. You will bring out much seed of the field, but you will gather little, and the locusts are going to consume it. Why? Down in verse 45. Why? All these curses are going to come on you and pursue you and overtake you until you're destroyed. Why? Because you didn't obey Yahweh your God by keeping his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded you. Well, why were the locusts being threatened? This is, this is by Moses. Okay, uh, The locusts were being threatened as something that was going to happen if they don't obey and if they don't keep his commandments. So just like we saw in Exodus 10 and Joel 2, they're to motivate us to be faithful to God. Okay, so there, so there we can see the, the, the locust. Okay, um, we saw in Revelation that they are likened unto horses. Where are the horses? Right there. The appearance of the locust was like uh, horses prepared for battle. Okay, we saw that, we saw that in Joel already, um, but we can also see it um, in Job. Okay, so Job 39. Nineteen through twenty. <clears throat> Job says, um, "I think this is Yahweh speaking. Um, do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with the mane? Do you make him leap like a locust? His majestic snorting it is terrible. Notice there that even a horse is likened unto a locust. There, and Job is like full of poetry. So okay, so that's that's there. Okay, so that's so we we got that reference. There's, of course, you can look at some of the other ones there too." Okay, um, what was the function of horses uh, in prophetic literature? Let's look in, in Jeremiah, chapter 8. Jeremiah, by the way, is the prophet Jeremiah in the 6th century B.C., um, speaking to the people of God, speaking to, to Judah, 
um, to the Israelites that are still there, uh, trying to get them to repent. So this is speaking to the people of God, not to not the pagans, not to unbelievers, but to the people the people of God that haven't repented. Jeremiah eight and verse twelve says. Were they ashamed because of the abomination they had done? They certainly were not ashamed. They did not even know how to blush. I mean, look at this, the lack of humility because of their sin. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time of their punishment, they shall be brought down low, says Yahweh. How is he going to do this? How is he going to bring them down low? Verse, from Dan has heard the snorting of horses, the sound of their neighing of the stallions, the whole land quakes. They come and they devour the land in its fullness, the city and its inhabitants, okay? So because people aren't going to repent, guess what? Threat of horses. Okay. Um, lions. <clears throat> we read in Revelation that they have teeth like lions. I should have read this while we were back in, in Joel. Uh, Joel 1 and verse 6 tells us that nations invaded my land, mighty without number. Its teeth is like the teeth of lions, fangs like the lioness. Okay, well, we know that Joel has already been a major reference, okay? So all this imagery, by the way, has been drawn from the Old Testament in some major ways. <clears throat> Let's look at scorpions. I can only find one reference for scorpions. Um, I've never spent so much time looking for animals in the Old Testament. It's been a pretty funny study. Okay. This is the only place I can find um, the function of scorpions being used to bring about change. Uh, this is when Solomon died and his son took over, and he's talking about how he's going to get the people to follow him. <laughs> Whereas my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. How does this king want to bring about the people of God under his control to follow him by disciplining them with scorpions. Okay. So the biting of the scorpions, you know, not meant to kill people. They're meant to bring about change. Okay. <clears throat> um, I do want to talk a little bit about this in, in, in Revelation 9. And, and we might not fill in all the details. That's fine. We'll just kind of see how things go. Okay, so we've got, we've got this abyss, this, this thing that seems to be the opposite of heaven, and it looks terrible, and we want to have nothing to do with it. Out of it comes locusts. They have power. Power is given to them, by the way, so the power is given to them. It can be taken away. God's still in control. God's in charge. Okay, uh, they're like scorpions. We know that scorpions are trying to discipline, but these locusts, by the way, they do the opposite of what locusts do. Most locusts eat green things. These don't eat any green things. They, um, they threaten people, but whom are they threatening? They threaten those who don't have the seal of God in their foreheads, okay? By the way, hypothetically here, if this was prophetically talking about the future of some sort of tribulation prior to the end, why are the people of God still here? Shouldn't they have been, have been raptured off to heaven? Doesn't work. Doesn't fit. Moving on. <clears throat> okay. Uh, they're not permitted to kill anybody, but to torment them for five months. What's five months? Well, Locusts live for five months. That was kind of universally understood in their culture. The lifespan of a locust is five months. That's why it's there. Okay. Um, that's, that's pretty much agreed. And also five is kind of just a, a, a small limited number. Okay. Um, their torment is like a scorpion. Um, and, and, and notice this, this threat that's trying to bring about their change. It's not trying to kill them. I mean, they're going to seek death. And Lord, they're going to seek uh, the death. Yeah, tone, found a tone. They're going to seek the death, this personified death. They're not going to find it. They're going to long to die, but again, um, oh, Thanatos, the death is going to flee from them. Okay? I mean, it's, it's like death is its own personified thing that takes up and is like running away from them. Okay? Um, do I have a place right there? Oh, longing for death. Um, yeah, so there's some other places um, in Job and Jeremiah where people, uh, they I mean, they just, they long to die. They long to die. Um, and even in Revelation chapter six, we've already read that uh, when the, uh, the people are threatened, they, they, they hide in the mountains and they say, fall on us, you know, cover us from the wrath of God and the lamb. So that shows up in the Bible. Okay. Um, they got appearance like locusts. Um, they're like horses prepared for battle. They've got crowns on their head, crowns of gold. Okay, if you got a crown on your head, that means that you're you're a victor. You've you've won a victory. Okay. Oh my goodness. So these 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 locusts, they 
I mean, they, they've, they've already won a ton of battles and they're coming after us, okay? It's almost like the, the threat is inevitable. They've got the, the faces of men. They, 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 look, like, uh, they, they look like men. It's a, it's a terrible uh, army that's coming. But remember back in Joel chapter two, it spent, you know, 15 something verses talking about an army that wasn't a real army. It was really locust. So it's drawing on that. Um, hair like women, um, long hair. Uh, there's, there's some, uh, I'll admit to this, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I'm kind of like 70% sure with this whole thing. Um, uh, I will tell you this, uh, this is not the whole Hal Lindsey, uh, these are helicopters, okay? That's a joke. Like, <laughs> some people think these are, these are helicopters. No, that's not what it is. Um, there were, uh, there, there was one in, in the first century world. How would the people in the first century world have understood this? Um, there was a, uh, a particular army that had always given trouble to the Romans, and that was the, the armies of Parthia, the Parthians. And if you've probably seen uh, pictures of Romans uh, and their haircuts, they always would wear their hair short, okay? They actually used to have a haircut called the Caesar cut, okay, which is a short haircut. That's because people in that culture would wear, at least men, men would wear their hair short, okay? Women would wear their hair long, okay? But here it seems like there's a threat of an army to where men have hair like women. And the only people in the first century world that had men that would wear long hair were the people of Parthia, okay? They had long blonde hair and that made them stand out in their culture. And so maybe this is one of those kind of veiled threats that, um, okay, these, these armies of Parthia that have always made the Romans feel uncomfortable, uh, they might be in the background here. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm I'm kind of leaning in that direction, but I'm not really sure. It only gives us one verse to work with. Um, but we've already seen that a little bit in Revelation um, in chapter six with uh, the threat of horses with bows, bows and arrows, because that was only that was not a Roman military image. That was a Parthian military image. And so this would make those people in the first century churches that have compromised with Rome and felt comfortable with the Pax Romana and the Roman peace say, hmm, if, if, if now these, these enemies of Rome are threatening us. Maybe I shouldn't put my trust in the peace of Rome and in the Roman Empire. Maybe I should put my trust in the kingdom of God and in the Lamb. So maybe that's what's, that's, that's my best guess as to what the hair is. I've tried to spend some time figuring that out. Teeth of lions, we already saw that uh, in uh, Joel 1.6. Um, we, we see they have breastplates, uh, wings like chariots. We saw that in Joel 2, rushing into battle. Uh, tails like the scorpions, and they sting and they hurt people for five months. Um, but again, this is not, not everybody. It's, it's, it's the threat against those who don't have the seal of God. Uh, again, five months is the lifespan of the locust. Uh, and they have a king over them. The locusts have a king, okay? Now, let me, let me tell you, if you do a study in the Old Testament of locust and king, you will find one passage. You will find Proverbs 30, verse 27. I'll look at that real quick. So I want you to see how Revelation takes the Old Testament imagery and just modifies it. Why did I go to Revelation? Proverbs. Uh, 27. Look what Proverbs says. Locusts have no king, and yet they all go out in ranks. You know, we read in, um, in Joel, the armies, they go out in ranks, and they're locusts. And in Revelation, it's, guess what? Now the locusts do have a king. So it's like, you see what Revelation's doing? It's drawing on the Old Testament, but the Old Testament doesn't dictate how it works. Revelation says, I can modulate this imagery and these, uh, these symbols any way that I want it to, in a sense to where it could do something completely different. So now it introduces something here that, um, you know, there's, there's some debate as to what this is. Okay, um, so now the locusts have a king. Who is the king of the abyss? It is the angel of the abyss the angel of the abyss, okay? And his name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, it's Apollyon, okay? Now, Abaddon, you guys should know this, uh, Abaddon is a place, it's a location in the Old Testament. It's a location for destruction, okay? So here are the places to where, and, and usually it's, um, it's, it's, it's uh, used in parallelism um, with Sheol, with the grave, because that's where people go to die. Okay, um, so Abaddon is a location, and uh, the word Apollyon, that's just a word for destruction. Okay, so 
I mean, I mean, look at the imagery that's being used of this angel. The angel is defined as something that is over an abyss, this unending opposite of heaven. His name is described as the location of destruction and destruction itself. I'll look at one of those passages, uh, Job 26.6. Let's do that one. Best thing to do is, is probably just to, to write off these references for yourself and to go check them on your own time. We just don't have time to look at them all. I'm just trying to be exhaustive just to show I've done my homework. Uh, here's here's some, some parallelism in Job. Uh, naked is Sheol before him and Abaddon has no covering. Well, if it has if it's naked, it has no covering. So Sheol and Abaddon there in what is called synonymous parallelism are just two different ways of talking about the same thing. Okay, Notice there that Abaddon is not a person, it's a place, it's a location where people are destroyed, that it's grave, okay? And the other references, Job 28, Proverbs 15, and Proverbs 27 all say the same thing. All right, we're going to talk about that. Now, here's something that's interesting too, okay? The angel of the abyss. Let me ask you this, is this, is this a good angel based on what we've read in Revelation 9, or is this a bad angel? What, what is your gut impression, good angel or bad angel? Okay, Sergio says bad, bad angel. Okay, let me tell you, there, there's no good angel that I know has a name of destruction or is defined by the abyss, okay? And keep this abyss thing uh, in mind because later in Revelation, we're gonna see that the very first beast comes out of the abyss. The very first beast comes out of the abyss. The abyss is bad, that's bad. We don't wanna be associated with the abyss, okay? Now, let me give you some interesting references, okay? Let me tell you about, a little bit about the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? I should write this out. Um, okay, uh, shortening. Dead Sea Scrolls is short for D DSS, okay? They were written somewhere between 150 BC to about 50 AD, okay? So about a 200 year, around 200 years, okay? So, um, so that, that sort of, uh, I don't want to say that literature is out there, but the, this sort of way of talking about things is very interesting. I want to pull two references here um, from the Dead Sea Scrolls. I translated these myself, so I know that they're right. Okay. Okay. So first reference comes from an interesting reference called 1QM 13, 11 through 12. Okay. Don't worry about that. So this is what they're saying in the Dead Sea Scrolls around this particular time period. God made Belial. By the way, Belial is another way of talking about Satan, for the pit, an angel of enmity in, in darkness is his domain, and his counsel is to bring about wickedness and guilt. And all the spirits of his lot are angels of destruction. They walk in laws of darkness, okay? So here we see that Belial, which by the way also does show up in 2 Corinthians 6.4, if I'm not mistaken, 2 Corinthians 6.14, someone can check that reference. Says, what does what does Christ have to do with Belial? So it does get it does show up as a reference for Satan in the New Testament. He's called he he's he's made for the pit. He's called an angel of enmity, and then we have a curse in 4Q286. That means it came out of the fourth cave. Um, accursed be Belial, who is called the angel of the pit, and accursed be the spirits of Abaddon. We just showed it up there. Okay, so. The Jews who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, if they had read this reference here to the angel of the abyss, who is called Abaddon, with whom would they have identified this angel? They would have identified this angel as Belial, as Satan, okay? Now, I will admit, in, in Revelation scholarship right now, it's about 50-50. It's about half and half, like there's no consensus. Like half of the people say, yes, it does refer to Satan. The other half say, no, it doesn't refer to Satan, but it's closely associated with satanic and demonic things. So, um, but this is the sort of literature that, uh, I don't want to say literature, I mean, because it wasn't like the Dead Sea Scrolls were out there for people to read. Uh, but that was the kind of things that Jews were saying in that culture. Okay, um, and then what we see at the end of 12 is that the first woe is passed, two more are coming. What this tells us, by the way, is that, you know what? Everything's going according to plan. Nothing that is, is being said here is just like it's out of control that God can't take care of it. No, everything is going according to plan. Here's the first one, two more are coming. It's the fifth trumpet. We know that there are two more trumpets that are going to come, trumpet number six and trumpet number seven. Okay, um, I'll stop sharing my screen. 
Uh, hopefully that is, hopefully I, I've, I've made you feel a little bit more comfortable with the text and have left you with more questions answered than questions unanswered. But um, let me stop right now. Let me, let me I'll give a, a little bit of time to answer some questions. And then how about let's do this. 10 minutes for questions. And then I'm going to pass it over to Melissa. And then if anyone has any questions, I'm willing to stay afterwards and answer all the questions you have. Uh, Dean, I see your hand raised. Is that, was that raised from before or is that a new, a new question? It's a new one. Okay, the go ahead. The abyss would be symbolic for Satan and his host, not literal. Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, I'm, I'm wondering, well, I mean, is Satan's name Abaddon? Not literally. No, but Abaddon it would be re re representative of Satan and his host. That's what I'm questioning. Would that be, obviously it would be, that would be true, but is that symbolism or is it literal? Well, I'm, I'm leaning in the direction that, that this is Satan. That, that's the direction that, I, that I'm leaning, okay? But, but I admit that uh, there's, there's a difference of opinion out there. And you know what? I'm, I'm open to having my mind change. I don't have all the answers of what Revelation means. And I'm willing to admit that I'm wrong if I see evidence going a different direction. But uh, it seems that there's, there's evidence out there that there were uh, Jewish people, pious Jewish people, that were saying exactly that Belial is the angel of the pit um, and describing it with Abaddon. And um, so uh, that's how they would have understood this. So... Uh, so that, that that's 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 how I'm leaning at this point. But I'm I'm, uh, I'm open to change my mind. But that's 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 where I stand today. Anybody else have any questions or anything I can clarify? Uh, uh, hand raised. Yeah, I just had a quick question. I guess maybe it's a comment or maybe it's a question. I'm not sure, but it seems like, and forgive me if this is a duh, because I think you've said this before, but uh, like this is this is written more to make those who are kind of ha halfway committed to make the full commitment than it is as a warning to those who are completely turned their back on God. Cause it seems like, you know, it's just one of the things that for me, it, it just keeps, there keeps, I keep finding examples in scripture of people who didn't repent. And it's like, Oh geez, I really don't want to be like that guy. At least that's something that, that's been happening for me a lot um, uh, the last few months. And so maybe I'm just looking at it that way because that's my, been my experience this last few months. Um, but it's just puzzling to me. Why are we so rebellious, mankind as a whole? Why do we not acknowledge God as he is? Why do we think we can go our own way and just do whatever we want and not acknowledge God who created us, who gave us who, everything good comes from him? Um, but, but I believe, well, not, I believe it's, it seems pretty obvious from scripture that one of the reasons that these examples keep showing up, just one example, Pharaoh and, and so many, many others is to remind us, Hey, you don't want to be like that person. You, you want to, you want to stay faithful and you want to keep repenting, um, as is necessary for the rest of your life. Yeah. I think that's, that's well said. I think that's absolutely right. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I would make a sharp distinction between um, is this written to compromising Christians or is it written to to threaten the, the persecutors of the people of God? Um, I would say the function would be to speak to both points. It's both and. Um, so it's 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 um, as it's talking about the judgment of God that could be poured out uh, by itself. Uh, it's of course as you're saying, repeating this common theme that the people of God need to be reminded that we need to repent, that we need to, we need to continually to give ourselves faithfully to God. Uh, and of course, a good way for us to do that, by the way, is, is to preach the gospel and encourage people with the gospel, you know, say that to each other constantly. Hey, the kingdom is coming. Isn't that great? Let's get ready. You know, hey, Jesus has been raised from the dead. Isn't that great? You know, let's, let's live in light of that. Um, hey, we've been identified as God's um, spirit filled people. Let's live in light of that. You know, the full consummation of that, um, new creation is coming when Jesus returns. Let's, 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 let's get on this train and let's ride together. So, um, don't get left behind. I uh, try to teach revelation without talking about left behind. That was an accident. Okay. 
bad joke. All right, Pam, you got a question. Well, my question is more, it's not a question, it's really a comment. When you were talking about the locusts and the representation of the fact that that represents the, uh, an army, I started thinking about, you know, and the, and the way it's described about the, the armor that's on them. Mm -hmm. They, today, I mean, that's the way they were created is that they have this hard carapace that protects their body. Um, locust swarm or were scorpions also have the hard carapace but they are individuals they only come together to yeah they only come together um, to mate never to congregate so I just thought um, that's kind of interesting how God uses the the um, the locust um, and the swarming and the, they really are kind of fearful. Look at it. Look at the one you picked up. My <laughs> well, well, no, no, this is, <laughs> here, here I, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because I almost forgot to do this. Okay. This is a picture of a statue of Apollo with a locust in his hand, because sometimes Apollo, the goddess, the, not the goddess, the god Apollo was described as uh, the master of the locust. And in some of the coins, he was, he would have his face, on one side and a locust on the other side. And what's interesting there, by the way, is that remember the names? What are the names? Apollyon, would that have evoked Apollo with locust, okay? Some people have suggested that there's kind of a, an implicit connection there. Um, and so that's why I found that. I, I couldn't give the entire picture because it's, it's one of those statues where um, he's not clothed and it's not really appropriate for for Facebook. Uh, so I just, I just took a picture of the hand. Uh, but yeah, so there, there's, there's that aspect is, is there as well. So, uh, so there, there, there might be a, a deliberate connection with Apollo, the God of locust um, there in the text. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm uh, that's one of those. I'm about 80% convinced. Uh, but there's, there's some reference there that, that people would have heard it that way. So again, another reason why those images would have made sense in the first century, but that sort of imagery of Apollo and locust, what relevance does that have today in the 21st century if Revelation was not written to people in the first century and was only written to us, as some of us were told growing up? So, well, also, if you look at the mummy, I think it was the mummy, one of those movies that had the locust just completely annihilate. Um, well, I don't think it was a mummy, it was some kind of horse racing. Um, anyway, the locusts in the desert basically blackened the whole area, yeah. ate everything in front of it and left destruction behind it. It was, uh, yeah. very representative of total annihilation by an army of some sort. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, I'm, let me, let me, let me get Diane, um, because I haven't, haven't been able to answer any of your questions there. And then, uh, Sergio, I'll probably... If you could wait until after, uh, I'll, I'll answer everyone's questions, but I, I want to be respectful of Melissa's time. So, okay, Diane, you get the last word. Thank you. So did I understand you correctly to say that you're not 100% convinced that Abaddon is Satan? Uh, see, the, the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning in the direction that's, I, I think that's what's right, that, that the angel of the abyss is, is is being um, is is Satan in this in this uh, in this book? Okay, okay. So that's um, that's 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 what I'm thinking it is. So, but uh, it, it, it's it's it, I mean, there's no actual like the angel is this. Okay, because like later in Revelation, it'll tell us that Satan is the dragon, is the devil, is the serpent of old. Okay, that's clear. I get that, but it doesn't say exactly that it's the angel of the abyss. Um, so, but I'm just, you know, clearly this is, this is an evil, demonic, satanic angel. Is it Satan himself? Um, I'm saying probably. Okay. But, but you know, it's, it, it's, the text doesn't actually say that. I'm, I'm just, I'm seeing where the wind is blowing and, and looking at the clues. Okay. So, I, I, you know, I, is it, is it okay for people in Bible study to admit their own skepticism? Is that, is that okay to do? Yes. So. I can say I don't know. Uh, okay. I, I actually appreciate that 
that I think that that is an indicator that someone has some humility and that you can trust them rather than they're going to claim that they know everything and you know that's just that's not something <laughs> something that indicates character to me but yeah I well I, I can't I, I know for a fact I don't know everything um, on this but I'm trying to I, I am trying to follow the details um, concisely and clearly, and I am trying to take the details seriously. And I am trying to, as best I can, fit these passages in the bigger picture and to trying to keep us all in that bigger picture. So um, whether successfully or unsuccessfully. Okay, um, I'm gonna end our recording and hand it over to Melissa, who's been very patient. Thank you so much. <laughs>